Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. We are so delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. You know that we would love to hear from you. So today we're taking your questions and your comments. You're watching. It's Monday. We're a live broadcast. Give us a jingle at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can reach us at 205-271-2980. And you can always send us an email with your question or your comment to jimandjoy at ewtn.com and check us out on Facebook. So today we're doing our show a little different, right? As you're um, watching, you're saying, wait a minute, they're not sitting at their little table. What is going on? Well, we have a surprise for you. So how does your formation of conscience impact your voting? And because we're sitting here today, we have Colin Donovan. And Colin Donovan is the vice president of theology here at EWTN. And he's going to be sharing with us about the fundamental importance of participating in the political process as Catholics and what the most important, what are the most important matters are in determining how you and I cast our vote. Colin, we love having you every time you're here with us. Thank you so much. And uh, so you've heard the question of the day, and mm -hmm. there's so much that could be yeah. addressed under that. But we really, really do just want to hear from you on those issues of formation of conscience, uh, do good, not evil, negotiables, non-negotiables. That's a big mouthful for a short sure, time. Yeah. But you tackle it any way you want to tackle it. We want our people to get the essentials and to go into that booth with a formed conscience. Yeah, and I think most people would realize, Catholic, non-Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, that they, they want to make a reasoned vote, a vote that is justifiable to themselves, justifiable to their neighbors in a sense as well, because we're all building a society, we're all responsible for the society, we the people of the United States, as the preamble of the Constitution says. So th that would be true whether you're Christian or not, but as a Catholic then, we also have the responsibility of faith, which tells us that the church speaks authoritatively for Christ and therefore the Father. And in its moral teaching, it gives us ways of uh, appreciating and understanding this uh, election context as it does for most other oral is uh, moral issues. You said do, you know, do good and not evil. Right. That's the basic moral principle that all human beings ought to be guided How by. How do we know what's good? How do we know what's evil? How do you, another exactly. Moral. And the church, it's the your church good, tells it's us my that. good, it's your evil, it's my evil. Yeah. And it's become so subjective. But we have to remember that uh, in, both in our consti constitutional system, but also as a matter of gratitude for living in a particular society, whether it's this one or another one, that we, we ought to take responsibility for the society. And the church and the catechism of the Catholic Church says that we sh one ways we take responsibility is to vote. The Bishop's Conference in its faithful citizenship document right. does, says the same thing. So in taking responsibility to vote, what should we be pursuing? What should we be looking for? Pope Benedict set out the basic principles of this a number of years ago, which you can also find in the Compendium of Social Teaching of the Church. And that is there are three basic social goods, or goods which are common to all, all, everything we do. And that first one is life, and that means the beginning of life, certainly in the end of life, but also the dignity of life within, uh, throughout yes. the span of living. There's also natural family and marriage, of which society is simply a conjunction of all the little cells of society, the families. The church speaks of that as such. And the other area is, uh, uh, is uh, religious freedom, the, the right to be able to raise your children according to your beliefs and act according to your beliefs. Parents' place in the family with their children. That's like a non-negotiable, isn't it? The priority. It, it is because you're trying to you're trying to build this first cell of society. Yeah. This is one of the reasons that if you're talking about well, what evils are opposed to this, mm -hmm. you would say well, abortion is opposed to life. There are other ways to disrespect life, but in an essential way, abortion is. And then the nuclear family, the natural family, a man and a woman, other kinds of families which circumstances may come together, adoption or whatever. Those, those we can understand those. But it's not a natural family to have two men or two women and these things which gender ideology pushes. 
and especially when you talk about uh, you know trans men and women these are things which nature doesn't conceive and the church doesn't uh, either and then finally in the liberty question the right of a person to have beliefs and to think and act according to them extends to all of the other civil rights that we think of we think of the you know the freedom of speech and the freedom to associate and the freedom of religion all of these things flow from the individual's right to think and believe as he should as long as it doesn't hurt the other person that would be that would be wrong and so when considering who to vote for we should be looking at all of those things obviously if you don't have life as john paul ii said in uh, christi fidelis yeah. laici his uh, exhortation on the laity he talked about this in paragraph 38 if you don't have life then the other things that are of concern yeah. health care and other rights those things are important those reflect human dignity but the essential element the intrinsic element is life and so there is a d distinction between what's non-negotiable life is non-negotiable okay. policy things regarding how do we govern immigration how do we govern health care how do we provide good health care for everybody in at least at some minimal level all of these policy kinds of things are for political negotiation okay. there are many ways to achieve those and those have to be debated in the society but the essential things are there and must be respected so when you're looking at candidates who has the greatest respect for life when you're looking at family who has the greatest mm -hmm. respect for family as designed by god and also by nature if you're not a believer and who has the respect for liberty mm -hmm. These are three areas in which we can compare our candidates. First, their history. How have they governed? What are the principles they operate by? What are the principles their party operates yeah. by? Since no one politician can get everything accomplished and has to rely on other people of like mind. And finally, who has the greatest respect for the liberty yeah. of conscience of others, of families, of parents, mm. of doctors and medical personnel who don't want to do certain procedures because they violate their conscience. Yeah. Without those <laughs> rights, without life, without the family, without the respect of conscience, mm. we are yeah. sunk as a society. And so there is a measure by which you can, dis you can discern, I don't like this politician's belief, position say on immigration or I don't like this one on abortion but how do they stand on the other goods right and to vote for the lesser of evil as the Pope suggested we ought to do and yeah. use our conscience to decide is to decide in the aggregate which policies will have the greatest benefit for life mm -hmm. family natural family and for freedom of religion and liberty in general those are the things we should be considering in this election. Colin, excellent. Um, you. You've done a number of shows with EW10, and there is something to be said for brevity, <laughs> that our show is short, <laughs> and you got it perfectly right on it. Thank, thank you excellent. Thank so thank you. much. Um, so how does your formation of conscience impact your voting? 1-800-221-9460, 205 271 We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember that we're taking your questions on our show today. So if you're watching, it's Monday. We'd love to hear from you. 1-800-221-9460, outside North America. You can reach us at 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email with your question or your comment to EWTN.com. And we had a wonderful conversation with Colin. Here's the question. How does your formation of conscience impact your voting. And Colin, I got to hear him also on um, Catholic Sphere. He was on with uh, Mary Hansel and also Doug Keck and, yeah. and Father Murray, and they were doing a great job of explaining and understanding and hopefully forming us as Catholics. I hope and pray that one, you're registered to vote. But say again, are you registered to vote? 
because we could talk all about, we like this candidate, that candidate, we want to vote against this referendum. If you're not registered to vote, you can't do that. Right. So you just go to, you know, if you could do a search, have somebody help you, and say registration for voting in Alabama, or whatever state. Whatever state if it's, you're in. If it's too late, just go ahead and register anyway, so you can uh, vote in the next election. I'm not speaking presidential election, any election that's coming up locally or other places. So first thing, I just wanted to underline that. Right. So I worked for a large pro-life organization, and I think it, uh, it's public who, who is registered to vote and who's not. Right, and the we percentages. We found out a lot of people who are pro-life and who were supporting this ministry, they were not registered to vote. Mm -hmm. so, so please uh, do that and uh, act on your patriotism uh, to make our nation the best nation it could possibly be. Right, and so one, you have to be registered to vote. Two, the other thing that probably this is the most important election of our lifetime and where we are as a nation and the dividing lines that are with us. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to be praying um, today is uh, the beautiful celebration of the rosary, yep. and we want you to be praying. I hope you're praying every single day that God would have mercy on our nation and, and that we as a people would go out and be a part of the solution and do what we need to do to make a difference and bring somebody with you. I, I guess it's Chronicles, Second Chronicles, I think. I'm just mm -hmm. going from memory here. And you, you, you've heard this verse, we just need to apply the verse. Mm -hmm. If my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. Mm -hmm. I will forgive their sins. I will heal the land. Does America need healing? The nations of the earth need healing. And so we need to pray and we need to act on our faith, especially as we go into the voting booth regarding candidates, referenda, amendments. In America, there are mm -hmm. numerous am uh, amendments to, co to constitutions state by state. Mm -hmm. And you just heard the premier uh, non-negotiable is that we shouldn't kill innocent human beings. Right. And, and, and so you got to go into the voting booth thinking that and how that applies to that amendment or referenda one well, of the candidates, as Colin right. said, and you might not have totally pro-life candidates, but what one could do the most good, what one could save the most lives, or what one can we work with the more, that's a consideration, as well as the referenda, the amendments uh, that are, are on your ballot when you go to vote, if you're registered to vote. And so you can go to EWTN.com forward slash vote, and it is a great website, and it's gonna give you all the information that you need um, it's going to explain it, everything that Colin, Colin Donovan was sharing with us. It's a guide for Catholics and your voting principles. How, because you might be, you know, you may have been raised as a Catholic in one particular party. You say, well, that's the party I've been raised in. Okay. Well, we have to vote the way that the church teaches us about life about marriage and family Malaysia and for the living. greater good of, and the religious liberty in our land. Yeah. And what party is going to do the greatest good? And Colin said it's what? We're not voting for a personality. We're voting for the beliefs and the values and the morals in which we believe that we're being guided and formed through the Catholic Church Another good website, EW10 is doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's called EW10.com forward slash formation of conscience, for a guide on understanding the how and why of forming your conscience. So it's just not a following my conscience and it's a freewheeling conscience. Mm. There needs to be self-discipline. It's like chastity. Chastity is about uh, mastering uh, self-discipline. <laughs> that's what it's about. So that's what we need to do in every area. And, you know, Colin mentioned, you know, because we want to vote rationally. We want to think things through. We want to reason about how we should do what we should do. And divine revelation, the teaching of the church, natural law, common sense should inform that. But we've got many, many people in the church and, and in our country and other places, they're emotional voters. Right. So, so right. they're not thinking 
rationally, mm -hmm. reasonably, what's best for the nation, what's best for children, what's best to build a civilization of life and love. No, it's like, I, I feel good about this person, I like this person, she or he is this or that, and, uh, and then they vote. And, and God's given us a mind for a reason and a soul, and, and we claim to be Catholics, we claim to be Christians. Uh, or we just claim to be people of goodwill. So in a lot of this, in terms of assessing things, um, you don't necessarily have to be Catholic or a Christian to look at the natural law mm -hmm. and to know that killing innocent people is not a good thing. Right. Um, marriage equality, like what, whatever that's about, two men, two women, three, four, five, you can't, you can't negotiate marriage. You may... We may have a new law regarding marriage, we may have a new interpretation, but you can't change natural law or common mm -hmm. sense. These things have to be in your mind and in your heart as you go into the voting booth. EW10.com forward slash vote. Uh, also, Novena for Our Nation. Joy, you were talking about prayer. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's uh, at missions.ew10.com, Novena, missions.ew10.com forward slash Novena. You can get a ebook downloaded uh, or a physical booklet to guide you in a worldwide prayer collective petitioning the help of the blessed virgin mm -hmm. mary we think of this especially on this day of the rosary right. blessed virgin mary for our nation and our people so we have to pray and we have to work for life for marriage for the family for the protection of, of our people and god has revealed the things that he wants through the natural law through the holy scriptures through the teaching of the church it's just a question of who's Lord in our lives, mm. and, 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 and voting according to what he has revealed to us in so many ways. Well, and I think at it, for a time, you and I have been called for a time such as this. We need to pray, we need to fast, we need to, I mean, I have been getting up in the middle of the night <laughs> praying, and I'm just, I'm, I'm crying out to the Lord, um, just for the, for the sake of our nation, for our land, for our country, because as America goes, so goes the world. And so th this is big, <laughs> and we really, we just can't treat it lightly. And we certainly, our hearts and our, our prayers go to all the people who are suffering so from Hurricane Helene, <coughs> and um, we just pray and are so grateful for all the people who are responding, and then finally now our government and sending National Guard, but so many people doing such heroic loving, kind things to help these people bear their great burden and misery. So let us be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, in our reason, in our souls, in our spirits. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, before we wrap up today's show, we're going to go hear from Joan Lewis, who's going to give us the latest news from the Vatican and the upcoming consistory in December. Joan, exactly what do you have for us? Well, greetings from Rome. And as you probably have already heard, it's been a very exciting weekend at the Vatican. And for example, yesterday, Sunday at the Angelus, just hours before going to St. Mary Major Basilica to say the rosary and, and beg the Blessed Virgin for peace in the world, Pope Francis announced he was creating 21 new cardinals on December 8th. And this will be 20 over the, 21 over the number that was set by Paul VI in November 1970. And also, by the way, 20 of those uh, announced are under the age of 80, therefore they can join the College of Cardinals and will become cardinal electors in the next conclave. Now, hailing from six, uh, six continents, the future cardinals can actually cement the legacy that the Pope has set up for himself when he's named cardinals. This, by the way, is his 10th uh, consistory. Now, on December 8th, the College of Cardinals will have 256 members 141 of whom will be, as I just said, cardinal electors. 
And by the way, the Pope himself has named 92 of the, before the uh, 8th of December, he's named 92 of the cardinals in the college. We're going to be back uh, in the future with a lot more information about the cardinals elect, in particular the oldest, who's 99, and the youngest at 44. Now, of course, the other big news of the weekend was um, yesterday's visit in the afternoon to St. Mary Major Basilica, where Pope Francis did pray the rosary and uh, beg the Blessed Virgin Mary for peace in the world. And this event was announced at the end of Mass on October 2nd, the Mass that opened the Synod on Synodality. And at the same time, the Pope also invited the faithful around the world to join him in a day of prayer and fasting, naming today, specifically, October 7th as that day for prayer and fasting. This, of course, marks the one-year anniversary of the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Now, um, it seems like every day when we turn on the TV, we see so much death and destruction and rubble. Images that come to us from, uh, from disasters such as horrendous floods, which we've seen in recent days around the world. But also some of the worst disasters, they're really caused by man. All we have to do is look at the wars and conflicts and the violence around the world. In particular, I think as Christians, um, what saddens us is what's happening in what we call the Holy Land. And as a matter of fact, on October 2nd at that Mass I just referred to, the Holy Father had this to say. He said, in this dramatic hour of our history, while the winds of war and the fires of violence continue to devastate entire peoples and nations, the Christian community is reminded of its call to put itself at the service of humanity. And of course, that's talking about today, the day of prayer and fasting for peace. So on that note, back to you. Joan, thanks so much. So much there that you shared and we're very, very grateful. So let us all do our part let us form our conscience. Go to ewcn.com forward slash vote. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. You're an important part of this family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.